The Blues Brothers are an American blues and soul revivalist band founded in 1978 by comedians Dan Aykroyd and John Belushi as part of a musical sketch on Saturday Night Live. Belushi and Aykroyd fronted the band, in character, respectively, as lead vocalist Joliet Jake Blues and harmonica player-slash-vocalist Elwood Blues. The band was composed of well-known musicians, and debuted as the musical guest in a 1978 episode of Saturday Night Live, opening the show performing Hey Bartender, and later Soul Man. In 1978, the band released their debut album, Briefcase Full of Blues, and opened for the Grateful Dead at the closing of Winterland Arena in San Francisco. They gained further notoriety after spawning a Hollywood comedy film in 1980, The Blues Brothers. After Belushi's death in 1982, The Blues Brothers continued to perform with a rotation of guest singers and other band members. The band reformed in 1988 for a world tour and again in 1998 for a sequel film, Blues Brothers 2000. The Blues Brothers featured on the National Reconnaissance Office launch number 7 Mission Patch 1. PNG The Genesis of the Blues Brothers was a January 17, 1976, Saturday Night Live sketch. In it, Howard Shore and his all be band play the Slim Harpo song I'm a King Bee, with Belushi singing and Aykroyd playing harmonica, dressed in the bee costumes they wore for the Killer Bee sketches. In 1978, guitarist Arlen Roth was performing on SNL with Art Garfunkel who was that week's host of the show. Before the actual live show, Belushi and Aykroyd asked Roth and others to join them on stage in the outfits that would later become the Blues Brothers look. Roth taught Belushi the lyrics to Rocket 88 so they could perform it that night. This was also discussed on Aykroyd's Elwood's Bluesmobile radio show, when Roth was interviewed about his Slide Guitar Summit album, and the song Rocket 88. Following tapings of SNL, it was popular among cast members and the weekly hosts to attend Aykroyd's Holland Tunnel Blues Bar, which he had rented not long after joining the cast. Aykroyd and Belushi filled a jukebox with songs from Sam and Dave, punk band The Vile Tones and others. Belushi bought an amplifier and they kept some musical instruments there for anyone who wanted to jam. It was at the bar that Aykroyd and Ron Gwynn wrote and developed the story which Aykroyd turned into the draft screenplay for the Blues Brothers movie, better known as The Tome, because it contained so many pages. It was also at the bar that Aykroyd introduced Belushi to the blues. An interest soon became a fascination, and it was not long before the two began singing with local blues bands. Jokingly, SNL band leader Howard Shore suggested they call themselves the Blues Brothers. In an April 1988, interview he gave to the Chicago Sun-Times, Aykroyd said the Blues Brothers act borrowed from Sam and Dave and others, the Sun-Times quoted him as explaining. Well, obviously, the duo thing and the dancing, but the hats came from John Lee Hooker. The suits came from the concept that when you were a jazz player in the 40s, 50s, 60s, to look straight, you had to wear a suit. The band was modeled in part on Aykroyd's experience with the Downchild Blues Band, one of the first professional blues bands in Canada, with whom Aykroyd played on occasion. Aykroyd encountered the band in the early 1970s, around the time of his attendance at Carleton University in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. And where his interest in the blues developed through attending and occasionally performing at Ottawa's La Hibou Coffee House. As Aykroyd described it, so I grew up, in this capital city. My parents used to work for the government, and I went to elementary school, high school, and the university in the city. And there was a place on Sussex Drive, and there was a little club there called La Hibou, which in French means the owl. And it was run by a gentleman named Harvey Glott, and he brought every, and I mean every blues star that you or I would ever have wanted to have seen through Ottawa in the late 50s. Well I guess more late 60s sort of, in around the Newport Jazz Rediscovery. I was going to La Hibou and hearing James Cotton, Otis Spahn, Pine Top Perkins, and Muddy Waters. I actually jammed behind Muddy Waters. S.P. Leary left the drum kit one night and Muddy said anybody out there play drums? I don't have a drummer. And I walked on stage and we started, I don't know, Little Red Rooster, something. He said keep that beat going, you make Muddy feel good. And I heard Howlin' Wolf. Many, many times I saw Howlin' Wolf. And of course Buddy Guy, Buddy Guy and Junior Wells, Sonny Terry and Brownie McGee. So I was exposed to all of these players, playing there as part of this scene to service the academic community in Ottawa, a very well-educated community. Had I lived in a different town I don't think that this would have happened, because it was just the confluence of educated government workers. And then also all the colleges in the area, Ottawa University, Carleton, and all the schools, these people were interested in blues culture. The Toronto-based Down Child Blues Band, co-founded in 1969 by two brothers, 
Donnie and Richard Hawk Walsh, served as an inspiration for the two Blues Brothers characters. Aykroyd modeled Elwood Blues in part on Donnie Walsh, a harmonica player and guitarist, while Belushi's Jake Blues character was modeled after Hawk Walsh, Down Child's lead singer. In their first album, Briefcase Full of Blues, Aykroyd and Belushi featured three well-known Down Child songs closely associated with Hawk Walsh's. Vocal style, I've Got Everything I Need, written by Donnie Walsh, Shotgun Blues, co-written by Donnie and Hawk Walsh, and Flip. Flop and Fly, co-written and originally popularized by Big Joe Turner. All three songs were on Down Child's second album, Straight Up, with Flip, Flop and Fly becoming the band's most successful single, in 1974. Belushi's budding interest in the blues solidified in October 1977 when he was in Eugene, Oregon, filming National Lampoon's Animal House. He went to a local hotel to hear 25-year-old blues singer-slash-harmonica player Curtis Salgado. After the show, Belushi and Salgado talked about the blues for hours. Belushi found Salgado's enthusiasm infectious. In an interview at the time with the Eugene Register Guard, he said, I was growing sick of rock and roll, it was starting to bore me, and I hated disco, so I needed some place to go. I hadn't heard much blues before. It felt good. In an interview with Crawdaddy he added, I couldn't stop playing the stuff. I bought hundreds of records and singles, I walked around playing that shit all the time. And then I knew Danny had played the harp in Canada, and I always could sing, so we created the Blues Brothers. Salgado lent him some albums by Floyd Dixon, Charles Brown, Johnny Guitar Watson, and others. Belushi was hooked. Belushi began to join Salgado on stage, singing the Floyd Dixon song Hey, Bartender on a few occasions, and using Salgado's humorous alternate lyrics to I don't know, I said woman. You going to walk a mile for a camel or are you going to make like Mr. Chesterfield and satisfy? She said, that all depends on what you're packing, regular or king size. Then she pulled out my gym beam and to her surprise it was every bit as hard as my Canadian club these lyrics were used in the band's debut performance on SNL. With the help of pianist arranger Paul Schaffer. Belushi and Aykroyd started assembling a collection of studio talents to form their own band. These included SNL band members saxophonist Blue Lou Marini and trombonist saxophonist Tom Malone, who had previously played in Blood, Sweat and Tears. At Schaefer's suggestion, guitarist Steve Cropper and bassist Donald Duck Dunn, the powerhouse combo from Booker T and the MGs and subsequently almost every hit out of Memphis Stax records during the 1960s, were signed as well. Belushi wanted a powerful trumpet player and a hot blues guitarist, so Juilliard-trained trumpeter Alan Rubin was brought in, as was guitarist Matt Guitar Murphy, who had performed with many blues legends. For the brothers' look, Belushi borrowed John Lee Hooker's trademark Ray-Ban Wayfarer sunglasses and soul patch. Their style was fresh and in many ways, different from prevailing musical trends, a very raw and live sound compared to the increasing use of sound synthesis and vocal-dominated music of the late 1970s and 1980s. In Stories Behind the Making of the Blues Brothers, a 1998 documentary included on some DVD editions of the first Blues Brothers film, Cropper noted that some of his peers thought that he and the other musicians backing the Blues Brothers were selling out to Hollywood or using a gimmick to make some quick money. Cropper responded by stating that he thought Belushi was as good as many of the singers he had backed, he also noted that Belushi had early in his career, briefly been a professional drummer, and had an especially keen sense of rhythm. The Blues Brothers recorded their first album, Briefcase Full of Blues, in 1978 while opening for comedian Steve Martin at Los Angeles Universal Amphitheater. The album reached number one on the Billboard 200, went double platinum, and featured top 40 hit recordings of Sam and Dave Soulman and the Chips Rubber Biscuit. The album liner notes fleshed out the fictional backstory of Jake and Elwood, having them growing up in a Roman Catholic orphanage in Rock Island, Illinois and learning the blues from a janitor named Curtis. Their blood brotherhood was sealed by cutting their middle fingers with a string said to come from the guitar of Elmore James. The band, along with the new writers of the Purple Sage, opened for the Grateful Dead for the final show at Winterland, New Year's Eve 1978. With the film, came the soundtrack album, which was the band's first studio album. Gimme Some Lovin' was a top 40 hit and the band toured to promote the film, the tour began on June 27, 1980 at Poplar Creek Music Theater. The tour also led to a third album, Made in America, recorded at the Universal Amphitheater in 1980. The track Who's Making Love peaked at number 39. It was the last recording the band would make with Belushi's Jake Blues. Belushi's wife, Judith Jacqueline, and his friend, 
Tino Insana, wrote a book, Blues Brothers, Private, that further fleshed out the Blues Brothers universe and gave a backstory for the first movie. In 1981, Best of the Blues Brothers was released, with a previously unreleased track, a version of the Soul Survivor's Expressway to Your Heart, and alternate live recordings. Of Everybody Needs Somebody to Love and Rubber Biscuit, this album would be the first of several compilations and hits collections issued over the years. A 1998 British CD compilation, the Complete Blues Brothers, exclusively featured the Lamont Cranston Band's Excuse Moi Mon Sherry, from the LA Briefcase recordings, originally available only as the B-side to the Soul Man 45 Revolutions Per Minute single. On March 5, 1982, Belushi died in Hollywood of an accidental overdose of heroin and cocaine. After Belushi's death, updated versions of the Blues Brothers have performed on SNL and for charitable and political causes. Aykroyd has been accompanied by Jim Belushi and John Goodman in character as Z Blues and Mighty Mac McTeer. The copyright owners have also authorized some copycat acts to perform under the Blues Brothers name, one such act performs regularly at the Universal Studios Florida theme park in Orlando, Florida, and Universal Studios Hollywood. In 1995, the band collaborated with the Italian singer Zucchero Forniciari, who had been invited to the event in memory of John Belushi's 46th birthday. After a concert together, they registered the video clip of the famous Zucchero song Per Colpa di Chi at the House of Blues. In 1997, an animated sitcom with Jake and Elwood was planned, but scrapped after only eight episodes were produced. Peter Aykroyd and Jim Belushi replaced their brothers as the voices of Elwood and Jake. To promote Blues Brothers 2000, Dan Aykroyd, Jim Belushi and John Goodman performed at the Super Bowl 31 halftime show, along with ZZ Top and James Brown. The performance was preceded with a faux news report stating the Blues Brothers had escaped custody and were on their way to the Louisiana Superdome. Aykroyd has continued to be an active proponent of blues music and parlayed this avocation into foundation and partial ownership of the House of Blues franchise, a national chain of nightclubs. In Italy the franchise is now owned by Zucchero, who used the brand during the tour promoting his album Black Cat of 2016. Jim Belushi toured with the band for a short time as E-Blues, and recorded the album Blues Brothers and Friends, live from Chicago's House of Blues with Dan Aykroyd. Jim would later reunite with Aykroyd to record yet another album, not as the Blues Brothers but as themselves, Belushi slash Aykroyd, have love will travel. In 2004, the musical The Blues Brothers revival premiered in Chicago. The story was about Elwood trying to rescue Jake from an eternity in limbo slash purgatory. The musical was written and composed with approval and permission from both the John Belushi estate and Dan Aykroyd. The Blues Brothers featuring Elwood and Z regularly perform at House of Blues venues in various casinos across North America. They are usually backed by Jim Belushi's Sacred Hearts Band. The original Blues Brothers band tours the world regularly. The only original members still in the band are Steve Cropper and Lou Marini. The lead singers are Bobby Sweet Soul Harden, Rob the Honey Dripper Paparozzi and Tommy Pipes McDonald. They are occasionally joined by Eddie Floyd. Aykroyd most recently hosted a radio show as his character Elwood Blues on the weekly House of Blues Radio Hour, heard nationwide on the Dial Global Radio Network until 2017. It has now been succeeded by the Sam T. Blues Review which airs Wednesday nights on KHBT. In 1980, The Blues Brothers, directed by John Landis, was released. It featured epic car chases involving the Bluesmobile and musical performances by Aretha Franklin, James Brown, Cab Calloway, Ray Charles, and John Lee Hooker. The story is set in and around Chicago, Illinois. It is a tale of redemption for the paroled convict Jake Blues and his brother Elwood, who after a visit to Sister Mary Stigmata, otherwise known as the Penguin at the Catholic Orphanage where they grew up, choose to take on a mission from God and reform their old blues band in order to raise funds to save the orphanage. Along the way, the brothers are targeted by a mystery woman and chased by the Illinois State Police, a country and western band called the Good Old Boys, and Illinois Nazis. The film grossed $57 million domestically in its theatrical release, making it the 10th highest grossing movie of 1980, and grossed an additional $58 million in foreign release. With Landis again directing, the sequel to The Blues Brothers was made in 1998. It fared considerably worse than its predecessor with fans and critics, though it is more ambitious in terms of musical performances by the band and has a more extensive roster of guest artists than the first film. The story picks up 18 years later with Elwood being released from prison, and learning that his brother has died. 
he is once again prevailed upon to save some orphans, and with a ten-year-old boy named Buster Blues in tow, Elwood again sets about the task of reuniting his band. He recruits some new singers, Mighty Mac and Cab, a policeman who was Curtis' son. All the original band members are found, as well as some performers from the first film, including Aretha Franklin and James Brown. There are dozens of other guest performers, including Eric Clapton, Steve Winwood, Junior Wells, Lonnie Brooks, Eddie Floyd, Wilson Pickett, Isaac Hayes, Sam Moore, Taj Mahal, and Johnny Lang, Blues Traveler, as well as an all-star supergroup led by B.B. King called the Louisiana Gator Boys. On the run from the police, Russian mafia and a racist militia, the band eventually ends up in Louisiana, where they enter a battle of the bands overseen by a voodoo practitioner named Queen Mousset. During a song by the Blues Brothers, a character played by Paul Schaffer asks to cut in on keyboards, which Murph allows. This marks the first time in a film that the Blues Brothers play with their original keyboardist. 1978, the closing of Winterland 31st of December 1978, 1979, Radio and Records Convention, Los Angeles 1979, 1980, The Palladium, Live at the Palladium, New York City, New York July 1, 1980, 1980, Live in LA, Universal Amphitheater Los Angeles. 1st of August, 1980, 1987, Otis, Onions and the Blues, Live in Montreux, 1988, Live at Pistoia Blues Festival Italy, 1st of July, 1988, 1990, The Lion Tapes, Live at Park Municipal Lion Venice, July 6, 1990, 1990, Estival Jazz, Piazza della Reforma, Lugano slash Switzerland, 29th of June, 1990, 1992, Blues for You, Live in Montreux, 1996, On Parole and in Concert, Live at the House of Blues Atlanta. 1999, Live at the House of Blues Las Vegas, 2nd of March, 1999, 2004, Live in San Javier While not all members appeared in the original film, the full band included, at times, other members have included. Thanks for watching.